There we go. We are continuing in Luke because our Christ, Jesus, is Savior for all. Amen. And we will continue to look at that. Um, how many people took in some fireworks around the 4th of July? Uh, at least on TV, maybe you watched them on TV if it was raining where you were, right? Yes. As we go through this study, I want you to think about Every time I talk about Jesus, think about fireworks going off as he interacts with the people in these stories. But before we do that, because I'm more teacher than preacher, we have to do a review. So here's your review. Um, for the last three weeks, going back, well, actually four weeks to this part of Luke chapter 3, out of the water. The Spirit of God comes down upon him, and it looks like a dove to some people. There's other descriptions of it. The Spirit of God comes down upon him. Anointing of the King by God the Father. I want you to think of that. He is now anointed. He's 2930, and he's been anointed for his mission. Well, then he goes off to the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Doesn't eat. He's fasting. And, come, and then Satan comes to tempt him. I like to turn that around a little bit. Yes, Satan was tempting him, but actually Jesus was asserting his authority over Satan. Satan tried three different things, and Jesus just said, no, I'm the king. Sorry, I'm the king. And Satan had to go away, because guess what? Jesus is the king. Yes, he is. And then we come to this section where he goes uh, to Galilee, from the desert to Galilee. Little side note, all prophets have to go to the desert sooner or later. Jesus had his desert time, launched his ministry. Anyway, he quickly becomes well-known. But then he goes to his hometown, Nazareth. Heard about that just last week. It didn't go so well, did it? But what did he do while he was there? He made a declaration of his mission. Why did he come to earth? He came to proclaim good news to the poor. He was sent to proclaim liberty to the captives. He also brought recovery of sight to the blind. Side note, more spiritual blindness than physical blindness, though he does have a lot of miracles where he does that. He, is the, he comes to set at liberty those who are oppressed. He is proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. And all these things are triggers for people of that time who knew about the prophecies regarding the Messiah. But for us, these are beautiful promises. God, God has proclaimed good news to the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He has been sent to proclaim liberty to the captives. We can be free of sin. He recovers our sight. We no longer have to be spiritually blind. We are free. Liberty. Jesus, in these, in, in those, so far in this sweep, kind of a sweep of his ministry early on, he has established that he is the prophet by proclaiming the good news, and he's stating that he's the deliverer because he saves his people. And I hope that includes you saves his people. The quoting and adjusting of Isaiah 61, Micah went through that really well, um, but it provides us with Christ's mission statement. This is why he came. Sorry, back up one. This is why he came. He came to set us at liberty. Uh, with that, let's read together, let's read Luke chapter 4. And it's verses 31 through 44. That's our passage for today. <clears throat> and he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent 
and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done the man no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went into every place in the surrounding region. And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them, but he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Mm. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Jesus moves in the physical world. He establishes his authority over everything. In a sense, he bursts upon the scene. He bursts upon the earth. So that's why I brought up fireworks right at the beginning, because think about that. Not like a bomb blowing things up. It was like this beautiful announcement, right? Kaboom. And then and the sounds. Like I don't like watching fireworks on TV because I don't get the sound. I really like the sound part, too. Yeah, especially the crackly, whizzly ones. But anyway, uh, this, yeah, he just burst upon us in this amazing way. And now, as we go through this these passages, I want you to think about how Christ's authority is set forth. For he is the authority as God. So first, in the verses 31 and 32, we find out that he teaches as if he's God. Now that's no big deal to us today because we've read the Gospels, right? But those people were pretty astonished because who is this guy that acts like he knows the words from God. Just so you know, common practice at that time, teachers would refer to other teachers, especially historical ones, and you always had to reference things, and it was very rare that someone would speak something that they considered new. But Jesus spoke things that were considered new. He spoke as if he was the original source material, because Jesus is the original source material of everything all creation. So yes, he taught as if he was God. And it was in the preaching of God's word that people started to see authority. That's the word that's used. He speaks with authority. Yes, he does, because he is God. So that's the first kind of shot into the world. So, he's, so we've had Jesus baptized. We've had Jesus take on Satan, kind of the spiritual world. And now he comes and he's like, okay, it's time for my ministry and my mission to be shown to the world. And then first is his word, the authority of his word. Let's go this way. Well, next we have this story about uh, a man who has a demon. And uh, I'm going to begin with a testimony. Because uh, I don't know where you are, what you think about the spiritual world, or evil spirits, demons, whatever. Um, but if I tell you the story, then you'll know what I think. So quite a few years ago, early 2000s, um, I personally was at a very low spiritual point. Karen was having some struggles, too. Uh, I won't go into details because I have to protect other people. Um, but things were really, really low for us as a family. And we had five children at that time. Um, one night... Uh, we were awakened, and it was the kind of like sit bolt upright in the bed, awakened, because this low, guttural voice from de Karen's side of the bed, by the way, not mine. <laughs> this low, guttural, I got to lighten it a little bit, because it, it was, for us, it was deeply profound experience. 
low guttural voice just said my name in a way that raised the hair on the head, on the back of the head. It was very frightening. Karen was very frightened. We were both awake. Um, I think we responded right because we called on Jesus. And we did not have anything else like that happen again in the house or anywhere. But I'm telling you, that was an evil spirit. And it was in our house. It was in my bedroom. And it was on the other side of my wife. It was scary. I'm telling you, it's real. So as we go into this story, it's real. This is real stuff. Um, quick definition of um, being demon-possessed, which is what they say this man had, is it's just the direct exercise of a demonic power from within a person. I have not ha that is not what happened to us, fortunately. I, I, I have a hard time imagining that. But when I do try to imagine it, it sounds horrible. To be no longer in control of yourself, but something else controls you. That's a terrible thing. Okay, I don't want you to dismiss this because, you know, I understand we live in a modern scientific time. We're very rational people. We know. We know how everything works. That's called scientific naturalism. That is not what we see in the Bible. But also, let's not go to the other side, and there is a demon behind every bush. Everything that happens to me is Satan doing it to me. That's, that's going way too far the other way, because frankly, Satan really doesn't have to help me screw up. <laughs> I, I do it just fine myself. Yeah, I imagine he kind of ignores me. Oh, he's doing fine. I'll just leave that guy alone. Anyway. Also, I would like to say, there are things we can participate in that put us in what I would call a danger zone. Yep. You can participate in things that open yourself up, either to an attack or even to possession. Yep. I won't go through the list. There's a lot of heads nodding, so I imagine you have kind of things on your own list. The big one to me is do not participate in anything that has to do with the occult. Stay away. Don't have anything to do with the symbols. Don't watch stuff, videos about it, nothing. Just stay away from the occult. And as a Christian, if you're following Christ, if you want to be a disciple, why would you be looking at stuff like that? It has nothing to do with Christ. So, all right, enough warnings. You know, you've got your little lecture. Let's, <laughs> I'm going to read again what happened to this man. <clears throat> In the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. Jesus exercises authority in his word, and Jesus exercises authority over the spiritual word world. That demon had no, no cho choice. He couldn't really argue with him. He just had to do what he was told. All right. Um, there's some footnotes we should go through about this. Sorry, I keep getting confused about which way to go with this. And I'm going the wrong way. There we go. So here's a few footnotes from that passage. First of all, why do you think the de demon says, us? He cries out, what have you to do with us? Well, there's a couple of ways this could be taken. And I'm going to put two in front of you. First is, the demon is referring to all demons everywhere. Like thinking, this is the time. Jesus is here now. He's just wiping us all out right here and now, beginning with me. Could be. But let's listen to another one. The demon may be referring to himself or itself and the human, the man. Because the demon most likely thinks that the only way Jesus can destroy me is to destroy this human. Seems to make sense, right? Just get rid of the whole package, done. Well, you can kind of think about that, like all the pigs go over the cliff, right? And that finishes off the demons. Oh, interesting. So 
you can see, I kind of think that's it, because at the end of this little story, he says, no harm came to the man. The demon expected great harm to come to the man, but no harm came to him. And does that not demonstrate Christ's power, that he can get rid of the demon without hurting the man? Another one is, why do you think the demon names him? Why does the demon, in a sense, name Jesus? I know who you are. Why does he do that? Likely, he's trying to gain some kind of advantage, like, you know, set Jesus off balance. Or um, also, it could be that despite himself, he kind of identifies very clearly for us the combatants in this little battle between Jesus and the demon. And it's pretty obvious which side the demon's on. It's certainly not Jesus' side. And then one more footnote as we go through this. Why does Jesus silence the demon? He is the Son of God. Why? And this happens many times. It's going to happen. It happens at the end of chapter 4. Why does he say, be quiet? Well, first off, these demons are the wrong witnesses. Jesus does not share his gospel authority with evil forces. He shares his gospel authority with us, his followers, but never with the demons. Uh, and the other thing is, it's not the right time. Jesus does not want to reveal at this point in his ministry, the very beginning of his public ministry, that he is the Messiah. He's, he's not ready to deal with that. He's got other things in his mission to accomplish first, and so he doesn't want this getting out first. And it was wise of them because the whole idea of the Messiah by this time is so wrapped up in the politics of the time and, you know, the hatred for Rome. And we want the Messiah to come and tr trash Rome and get, him, get rid of them and then we can just be our own little nation. And that was not why Jesus came because he had a grander mission than this one nation, a much grander mission. So no harm came to the man. Jesus shows his power over demons because he casts out the demon and the man is fine. When Christ undoes things that are corrupted, he spares the ones that he's come to save. We don't know if that man who was freed uh, from the demon, we don't know if he followed Jesus or not. Did he become a disciple? We're not told. But we do know he was given the opportunity to do it that man's experience illustrates for us that the kingdom of God is breaking into the current age. He, Jesus is making a difference just in one man's life, but also, overall, he's making this declaration. Um, so yes, Jesus showed that God's kingdom was breaking into the prison age in a new and decisive way by driving out the demonic forces but you may be thinking, okay, it doesn't feel like his kingdom is here. There's a lot of junk going on, and it's ugly. So I got this little chart. I got this from a friend. Uh, it's not mine originally, but just to try and help people understand. And the idea is the already, but the not yet. So at the beginning of on the left side is the present evil age. Well, at the fall, that is the marker that starts the present evil age. So you have the garden, you have the fall, you have sin introduced, that begins the evil age. We've been going through it all this time, and then Jesus comes. Jesus says, I come with the kingdom. I'm bringing the kingdom of God. He is starting the kingdom of God on earth. And so that begin. then I have the beginning, right? And then now we're in this period. We're between Jesus' first coming and Jesus' second coming. He's coming again. But in the meantime, we are this weird mixture, right? Paul tells us we are the old man and the new man, and they're at war. By the power of the Spirit, the new man is growing, and the old man is shrinking. But the two are mixed. We have the evil age still continues. We are surrounded by evil. We're surrounded by sin. Sin is in us. However, the kingdom of God is also here, and it is moving. And now Christ will return, and then that's it. It's just the kingdom of God after that. You read all the promises of future prophecy, and that's just going to be the kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord.
That's the already, but not yet. You are already part of his kingdom, but it is not yet fully here. So Jesus is strikes again and again at the root of our misery, of man's misery, which is Satan's hatred for mankind. And that's kind of the origin of all our troubles, is Satan's hatred. Um, he is, but now his sweeping authority over the spiritual world cannot be contested. It was no contest during Jesus' 40 days and 40 nights in the desert fasting, and it's no contest with this demon, because that is our king. It's no contest. He has the authority. Now, Jesus also exercises authority, not just in the spiritual world, but over our physical world. And that's our next, the next story in this passage, which I'll read verses, uh, I'm going to start at 37. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. And he rose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. We would call that a miracle, right? So I looked up in the dictionary, I was just curious, like how do they define miracle? So this is from dictionary.com, this is what they say. First description, an effect or extraordinary event in the physical world that surpasses all known human or natural powers and is ascribed to a supernatural cause. I don't like their number one, I like their number two. Such an effect or event manifesting or considered as a work of God. It looks like grudgingly, maybe it's a work of God, right? And then it goes on, like we'll often use it like a wonder or marvel or something that happens or something that's just of amazing quality. Like when technology works, Paul thinks it's a miracle, that sort of thing. Yes, yeah. I want to swap one and two, but I want to add something to two. And this is what I want to add to two, that a miracle fixes things. Christ comes and we think he's just here to establish, what does that mean to establish the kingdom? He's come to return things to the state that reflects God's original intent. When God created, he had an intent. Don't understand his plan that he allowed his intent to change, right? To allow us to mess up, but he did. But when Christ moves in the world, he is returning things to a state that reflects the original intent that the Father had. That's why we're here. Miracles fix things. And we see that with Simon Peter's mother. Mother-in-law, sorry. Sorry, Simon. Don't want to... I don't know how good a relationship he had with his mother-in-law. We don't know, do we? Anyway... So if Satan's hatred is the root of all our misery from the very beginning of the fall, right, then I would say that bodily diseases are kind of like this spreading branch from that tree that just affects all of us. Well, Jesus strikes at that branch repeatedly, over and over again. He heals. And here we see it. Jesus addresses not an evil creature, as he did in the previous story. He just he addresses a disease. And with a word, he instantly cures Simon Peter's mother-in-law. It was an absolute and total cure. How do I know that? Because the woman hopped up and started doing like, you know, like she'd never been in bed for, with a high fever for who knows how long. It was an instant and total cure. And with that, Jesus proves he has authority over even diseases. Now, after showing his power to free one person from disease we learn that he goes on. Somehow, the whole neighborhood, the whole town finds out that Jesus is there and he's doing this stuff, right? He's healing. And so then we read, as the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. Everybody showed up. And we don't know how many that was, but it was probably a long night for Jesus, right? And so this shows, it wasn't just a one-off. Jesus didn't just do it one time and used up his power. Sorry, got to recharge, see you tomorrow. No, he came in and everybody who came to him was helped. Because for Jesus, every person is significant. And every person experienced Christ's compassion 
in that, at that time. Every single person. It's like, show. Every person was seen. Every person was heard, because I assume they told him what their ailment was. And every person was healed. Everyone. And so Jesus shows his power over the spiritual world. He shows his power over the physical world. And he shows that his power is not used up. That's our Lord. That is our Lord. All right. Now, these miracles picture a deeper reality about Jesus' authority. We tend to focus on the event itself, understandably, right? Wow. There was a demon in that guy. He's gone. Mother-in-law is almost dead from a high fever. Now, look, she's making falafel. This is terrific. We just, we just, that's us, right? We, fi we fix on the event. We rush to take in and experience Jesus, just what he has to offer us. What can we get? But really, these miracles are all to point to him as the king. That's why he did the miracles. Yes, he's setting things to rights, but why is he setting things to rights? Because it shows that he is the king, the king of the universe. The one, the miracles point to, came both to preach the good news and to save and restore. Now, just to wrap up this story, the people of Capernaum come the next morning looking for him, and what a different reaction from the his time in Nazareth, right? It's like, no, we want you to stay. Uh, I got this nice house. Why don't you stay here? Hang out with us. We really like you. We want you to stay, Jesus. And then he has a different, he has a different mission. And he tells them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom to all around. So today we've seen that Jesus, he can tackle the demons to show that he possesses the key to life. He, sorry, he tackles demons, he tackles diseases, and it all shows that he has the key to life. And with his authority and his exercise of cosmic power, Jesus bursts upon this earth with his mission of bringing the kingdom of God here and now. May we all experience the kingdom of God here and now. All right. Thanks. Let's close. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your precious word. And that singing of victory in Jesus. Yes, Lord, it is we rely upon you for the victory, trusting that by your spirit we may serve you and we may spread your gospel. Thank you, Lord, for your precious word. Amen. <laughs>